Welcome to episode 11 of season 2 of the Ubuntu UK podcast. It's Friday the 14th of August 2009 and in this episode we're going to interview Richard Johnson who's a core developer working mainly on Kubuntu. We'll cover the latest news and events and have some command line love. <laughs> uh, we'll have a segment called Who Do You Think You Were? Excellent. Then we'll do the competition, ecosphere and feedback. It's uh, not the ecosphere. Well, we'll have to talk about that at the time. Yeah. I'm Alan, and with me this week is Tony. How are you doing, Al? <laughs> Not bad. What have you been up to this week? <laughs> I finished upgrading all my servers. Hooray! Which is what I was talking about last time. Oh, right. Um, that's mainly it. I've been working on um, a couple of secret media projects. You keep talking about this secret project, and it's really annoying, because I, I don't know what it is. Laura, and Laura does. We're going to yeah, pin okay. Laura down yeah. and tickle her until she tells. <laughs> oh, <but laughs> oh my! Yeah, well, there we go. Thank goodness the webcams aren't working. Um, but yeah, so I, I've been using Ubuntu and stuff for that, but I haven't really been doing much technical geeky stuff other than that. But, cool. You know, it's been interesting and fun. Oh, ah, yes. No, the thing. Ah, the the, the thing that I have that I found is a, is a little application called Stills to DV, which uses FFmpeg and it uses uh, Encode DV and things. And you know, on documentaries where you have um, a still photograph. And the, the style these days, I think it's after a guy called Ken Burns, is like you start off with a, a part of the picture and it sort of pans out yep. sort of slowly over sort of a 10, 15 seconds or so. Mm-hmm. And then sort of by the end of the little bit of clip, you've kind of panned out to the whole photograph. Like a screensaver. Like a, like the Mac style screensaver or right. whatever, yeah. Um, that you can generate those in DV format, which will give you a little bit of a clue the sort of things I'm, I've been doing with my secret project. But um, yeah, so I found that that was a really useful tool. Cool. You're almost interested, aren't you? No, I'm just hurrying along to okay. ask someone else. Uh, Simon, what have you been up to? Uh, nothing really geeky, to be honest. Nothing Linuxy. Uh, Falling t- over in the woods. The only two things I note are uh, uh, spraining my ankle really rather well last night during an eight-mile run in the dark. See, I uh, keep telling you this exercise, Mark. <laughs> yeah, it's not good for you. If so. you'd driven, that yeah. wouldn't have happened. <laughs> <laughs> good idea. Well, where I was running, I couldn't actually drive, but uh, that was part of the problem. The only other thing couldn't is... Couldn't walk uh, either. <laughs> <laughs> the only other thing is uh, moving four tonnes of topsoil and 35 square metres of turf on Monday, which was wow. great fun. I assume you did that more than one journey. Yeah, you didn't... No, I did delivered and then threw all the mud on the ground and threw grass on top Are of it. Are you building a hill fort? <laughs> <laughs> yes in my back no it's a barrel mound in my back garden excellent <laughs> <laughs> is this after the kids have been mucking around with the computers <laughs> right. yeah. no you can't go on the internet get in the mound <laughs> 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 go on then now what have you been up to mate oh um i was gonna ask dave but <laughs> feel free um i ah i reinstalled my desktop um because i wanted to switch from 32-bit to 64-bit and um, one thing that we keep saying that you can't do with a live CD is install and do a RAID configuration easily. Software RAID? Yeah, software right. RAID, Linux, mirroring. I M- want it, I've got two M-Dad, discs and I want yeah. a mirror. Yeah, MDADM. Well, there's a new tool that's come into Karmic. It's developed by guys at Red Hat, and it's called Gnome Disk Utility, and it lets you manage RAID devices. And it's a graphical tool, and it's on the live CD now for Karmic onwards, and it lets you create RAID sets and stuff. Red Hat do bring us some quite cool stuff, really. They certainly they do. do. do good things. Yes. So Thank why you, did Red you Hat. need to switch to 64-bit? Any particular reason? or uh, Because the desktop has... Oh, well, I, yeah, okay. The desktop's got 8 gig of RAM, and 32-bit oh, right. only sees 4 gig. Up to 4 gig. But if you install, there is a kernel on 32-bit called Linux Generic, or Linux Image Generic PAE. Uh-huh. And if you install that, then it can see all 8 gig. So you don't have to actually switch to 64-bit to see I, I all thought, your RAM. I thought this issue was with your BIOS of your actual computer rather uh, the than... The BIOS can limit it as well. No, no, no it, it, there, there was a bug that you can only see 3.2 or That's something. That's on my laptop, not my desktop. Oh, okay. Yeah, my laptop, I'm staying on 32 gig. There's that 32-bit, there's no point going to 64-bit on my laptop. But on my desktop, it's got 8 gig, and I wanted to use it all. Yeah, because you did actually do some benchmarks about a year ago, and you did see um, a small bit... Possibly significant um, improvement, didn't you? Between no, I've uh, not done a benchmark. Yeah, you did about a year ago. I remember. No, seeing... I haven't. Oh, it must have been different, Popey. <laughs> <laughs> that was an insanely. Geeky I have run thing. Geekbench, the the benchmarking tool, but I don't think I run it under thirty two and sixty four on the same machine. Okay, Dave, what about you? 
Oh, oh, oh. <laughs> picked me last this time. I thought I was getting away a bit. Yeah, this sorry, time. did I catch you by surprise? <laughs> <laughs> I thought I was getting away a bit. Um, I've actually been working on two main things regarding with the Ubuntu server. Uh, one Ooh, of them, yes. yeah, yeah. Uh, one of them has been trying to get um, Asterix, which is the popular PBX uh, telephone server, uh, into uh, Karmic, uh, basically upgrade to a new version. Because um, to be honest, we don't do a lot of work with the actual uh, telephone stuff in Ubuntu. We do inherit pretty much everything from Debian. Um, so, so is, that, is that out of date then or something? No, no, it's still supporting. It still gets security updates, but we're getting more features. Now, it was really uh, mine and someone else's intention to try and get 1.6 into this one, give it a good bit of testing for the next LTS, because we're still not sure whether Karmic Plus One is going to be LTS or not. And I think it's kind of good to, to try and make that leap before an LTS. Although yeah. or, or, although we have had this discussion before that um, a, a, a six-month release shouldn't be considered like a development one or a testing one. Mm. Um, in, in some ways, in that respect, I think it would be okay to try and get some testing in before the next LTS because there's no way 1.4 can still be in LTS because it will probably won't last whole period because mm. it'd be five years support on the server but yeah. it being a server application yeah exactly yeah. and the other thing you said there was two things ah yes yes the other thing um okay um something which actually i was hoping we didn't just simon and simon might bring a lot of love to this now love is a big hint uh ubuntu server tips now this is something which is i mean we all have really some quite awesome things we all do on our servers and, and things like that that make general administration quite easier so, so some little gems there and the, the idea is is to try and collect them all into a package where um either uh, by by running a particular command, it will return a, a little gem or nugget of, like, of, of goodness. Like fortune cookie. It is actually using oh, fortune. Right. Oh, is it? Yes, oh, yeah. Cool. Um, now, the uh, the other thing is the current roadmap is to actually replace the actual copyright information when you first log in. You, you, the idea is you'll, you'll see it once when you first log in. Right. And then in future, you, you won't see that. So you, rather rather than wasting that space, use mm. a tip. Oh, that's quite a good idea. idea. So, I like that. Good idea. Yeah. So, yeah. So, so so I've been trying to collect a whole bunch of them, and there was a blog post out, and I was quite pleased that you know about twenty come in within the first sort of half hour, hour or so of that. So I was really pleased with that. The other problem is is trying to actually get translations because obviously you don't necessarily want to see it in English if that's not your native language. Yeah. Now, um, now Launchpad does actually make this quite easy. Now, I've been translating to British, which has not been too difficult, to be honest. <laughs> yeah. yeah, which has not been too difficult. But yeah, so, you know, if you've got any tips, then, you know, try and, try and track down my blog post. It'll be well, in the we'll, show notes. We'll put a link in the show notes to your blog yeah. post and where people can send their, their tips to. Yeah, because yeah, it's really easy. And, you know, if you've got anything really good, bring it along. Cool. Thanks a lot. Sounds like a fun pack show. Okay, so we've actually got an interview with Richard Johnson of fame of uh, Kubuntu work and also of the Motu Council. Do you want to tell us a bit about yourself, Richard? Um, yeah. Um, been with the Ubuntu community now for, I don't know, since about 2005. Um, working mainly in the Kubuntu area, um, the blue headed stepchild operating system. Just getting marked. <laughs> yeah, I've, you know, been able to. Uh, move up in the community, I guess you could say, and, and work with the various councils. Um, I know last year I was at a uh, at a local show and they were announcing and saying, uh, this guy is like on more councils than anyone can imagine. So, But I'm no longer on the Kubuntu Council. I've been replaced because I've done my year. I'm still on the regional membership board stuff. So, uh, Besides the Ubuntu, Kubuntu stuff, I've been a KDE member and developer uh, since the 90s sometime, um, while I was in the military, actually. Other than that, um, that's pretty much it. So, how, how, when did you first get into Ubuntu and Kubuntu? And what, I guess, um, obviously, you've been using Debian for a while, but what, what drew you towards the Ubuntu community? I was actually spying for another distro. <laughs> <laughs> it's honest to God truth. I was actually using Meepus at the time, and... You know, Ubuntu came out, and I was never a GNOME user or fan. Um, I mean, I, I had used it a couple of times back in, like, the late 90s, early 2000s. And, uh, yeah, I, you know, I, I came to Ubuntu and, you know, had my little hidden alias um, that I don't use today. So I wasn't external then. I was hiding. But, uh, yeah, I came in and tried to get some information and whatnot, and I kind of hung around and just saw the way everybody interacted. And I was like, you know what, this is pretty cool. So I hung around, hung around, hung around, and then finally one day I decided, okay, I'm going to disconnect, change all my IRC settings, 
And uh, that's, yeah, I pretty much joined back in 2005 after talking with, like, Jonathan Riddle and uh, Sarah Hobbs and all the old-timers back then. So you sort of came out of the closet as an Ubuntu user. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Excellent. I, Ubuntu, get I, it right. I, I think clearly you have to, um, with, with that said, you have to tell us what your original um, nickname was, because it must be something embarrassing. Um, honestly, I can't even remember. Oh, yeah. I'm, it was probably guest one, two, three or something. <laughs> <laughs> you, you mentioned um, a number of councils, and I know Ubuntu is kind of famous for having lots of structure and councils, and... Um, one of the one of the boards you're on is the regional membership board. Can you tell us a bit about what that does? What we have to do for that? Right. Um, what had happened is last year, um, up until last year, the community council was doing all the official Ubuntu membership stuff, and, and I mean, it just got to the point to where if they were to go through the list of people going for membership, it would have taken them two days, you know, in one sitting. Um, so the council come up with the idea that maybe they should split it up into into the various regions and whatnot. So I got on the Americas one, obviously, um, and worked the time zones here. So it's just like what the community council would do is people who have you know spent a little bit of time in the Ubuntu community contributing. Um, it doesn't matter what type of contributions it is, as long as they were sustained. I mean, you could be doing development, support in IRC, support in the forums. Um, you know, you name it, as long as it's you know. Um, supporting Ubuntu, you're, you're good to go. So after a few months, you know, people apply to become an official Ubuntu member. And when they do that, you know, they have a little application. And on IRC, um, in the meeting channel, you know, we the uh, membership board just sits there and questions them, um, all kinds of stuff. So we have some guys uh, on the board that are, they're old school. They, you know, make it tough for people to get in and whatnot. And then you have a couple of people, um, including myself, who are, who are kind of soft and and have you know have that little spot in the heart where you want everybody to become a member so so you do a kind of good cop bad cop thing <laughs> uh, yeah as a matter of fact yeah we do so and it's usually it's, it's really funny is cody somerville will be the bad cop i'll be the good cop <laughs> and then one night he might come in and he's in one heck of a mood and he's the good cop and i'll be the bad cop so. <laughs> Now, Richard, there, there, there's, um, there's, there's obviously Ubuntu membership you're talking about there. Right. Um, but I'm also aware of Kubuntu membership and, and things like that. Um, how, how does that differ then? Because that's, cause with the Ubuntu membership, you get uh, at Ubuntu.com email address. And with Kubuntu address, you get uh, at Kubuntu one. Now, I mean, I'm actually a Ubuntu member. But, I mean, if I, I, mean, I don't actually contribute to uh, Kubuntu or KDE. But if I did, what, how would I actually, what's the actual difference there? There actually is no difference. Um, the only difference is you'll do it during a, a Kubuntu developers meeting. Um, it's the same type of interview process. Um, and, yeah, you'll get the at kubuntu.org. So if, say you weren't working in Ubuntu and you're working with Kubuntu, and you didn't go for Ubuntu membership, you know, you were the Ubuntu or whatever, it is, you've signed the code of conduct. So you apply, excuse me, for a Kubuntu membership. So you become a Kubuntu member, you'll, you know, when you, as soon as you do that, you also become an Ubuntu member at the same time. Right. So, you know, they're, they're two of the same. You get the same benefits, the yeah. Linux Weekly yeah. News and right. LinkedIn yeah, or whatever I else. I, I don't know if I became a Kubuntu member first or Ubuntu member first. I can't remember now. Does, does membership of one automatically follow on to the other, or are they two separate processes? They're two separate processes. Okay. Um, we've had a question from Lopter on Identica asking... Um, why might a user who isn't a developer become an Ubuntu member, and does it cost anything? Um, it'll cost you about 10 to 15 minutes of your life on IRC. <laughs> That's about it. Um, did you want to know about benefits? Yeah, I mean, if you're not a developer, why oh, might, what are the benefits developer. of membership? Why might you become one? Why might you become one if you're not a developer? Yeah. It's, it's kind of... A lot of people will kind of say it's, it gives you that feeling of really fitting in. Um, it's kind of like, you know, the same thing as joining like a, a sorority or fraternity or your local government club, something like that. Um, you know, you just, you just get the support of the community. It's, you know, and it's just, I don't know what the heck you would call it. You, you also get voting yeah. rights, don't you? Um, on certain things like voting for the, the CC and stuff, you get, I think, um, a bunch of members get a vote uh, on some things. Plus, you get the Linux Weekly News subscription for free and you know, a few other things. Yeah, uh, I forgot about that. I haven't looked at that in a while. I have to fire it up now and get the reading. <laughs> so how long does the membership last? Does it last forever or a year or two years or what? It doesn't 
lasts forever. I mean, it lasts forever, but it doesn't. What happens is when we go ahead and, and mark you as a member in Launchpad, I think by default you get like two years. I can't remember. Mine just expired, as a matter of fact. Yeah, yours did today. Actually, yours did twice, I noticed. Yeah, because what happened is I went to re-enable myself, and it doesn't allow you to re-enable yourself, I guess. Oh. So, yeah. <laughs> oh, no, not if you've expired. It does before you expire. If, oh, if really? You, if you catch it just before it expires, you can renew yourself for another year. I would have known about it, but stupid Gmail flags all my launchpad mail is spam. <laughs> <laughs> Possibly useful in some ways. Presumably the code.google.com developers <laughs> slipping that little filter in. <laughs> yeah, I, I think marking all your launchpad, which, you know, that, that that's where all the sort of development of Ubuntu is actually planned and Kubuntu um, for a, a core developer, which you are, is probably not that helpful it being marked as spam. Right. Cool. Dave mentioned um, core developers. And um, what, so explain what the difference between just a, a, a well, not just, a, a Motu, um, like a, a master of the universe who, who's a, a developer in Ubuntu and a core developer. What, what's the separation? What's the difference there? Well, the, the, really the only difference between a Motu, which is master of the universe, and a core dev is Motu um, only maintain packages in the universe and multiverse repositories. Um, those are the only ones they have upload rights to. Okay. A core developer has upload rights to main, which is pretty much everything that's going to be on a CD. So a core developer actually has the ability to really ruin your day. <laughs> <laughs> so um, I mean, a Motu can do it as well, but it's, it's you know, uh, with, with the core developer, I mean, you're talking like the kernel, um, all the KDE core packages or GNOME core packages or XFCE core packages. Um, they all sit in main, so, and they're the ones that get on the CD. So, I mean, obviously one of your positions is, is being on the Motu uh, Council, so you actually get to pick when people become, um, m um, actually get approved as Motu members. I correct. Is that correct? Yes, um, it is. So, so, without going too much into that, uh, what's the actual process to actually get there? Um, the process for becoming a Motu is definitely different and a little bit more difficult than becoming a regular Moot, um, Ubuntu member. Um, so what you do is, you know, you spend a few months um, with some sponsors on IRC, um, work on packages and stuff like that. And after you've built up a, a decent set of packages that you've uploaded and, and your sponsors um, can sit there and say that you, you've done good on all your packages, um, even if you, you know, you lack in some spots and they say, for instance, um, we had uh, one guy, he lacked in copyrights. He always would mess up a copyright file. But because, you know, when he, if, when he would go to do his copyright file, the first thing he'd do is he would check with other members and say, hey, does this look okay? And because of that, you know, we still said, yeah, okay, he can be a Motu. He understands it. If he has any questions, we know he'll go somewhere and whatnot. Um, right. So, as, yeah, I mean, as long as you get some packaging, some bug fixing in for a few months, and, and I mean, your, your, your packaging skills don't have to be, I mean, dead on 100%. Um, as long as it's really, you know, you have really good packages, you're willing to learn, you work great in the community, then Motu is, is really easy to get. So, And the thing with, Mo, with the Motu Council also, we also recommend core developers to the technical board. And to, to be a Motu, do you, do you really need to be a, a developer? Do you need to be a C programmer? Oh, or no, a, not, a, not at all, no. I mean, I've worked... Um, as a matter of fact, I've only been messing with Python now for, I don't know, just over a year. I was never a big fan of it. I was, I was like, oh, I can do the same stuff with Bash. Um, but I was doing Python packages and actually helping some of the people even patch Python packages without even knowing Python. So, <laughs> you know, you don't need to know the code. Okay, cool. I mean, I, yeah, I've done GNOME packaging and Lord knows I don't know GTK or just flat out C as well as I do C++. So it's more important to be to know about the structure of a package and how a package yeah. is built. Exactly. I mean, it, as long as you understand, I mean, you need to be somewhat decent with the command line first off, you know. If you can un, uh, untar a package... Um, go ahead and build it manually and everything, you're on your way. Okay, so the actual Motu deal with the stuff which is uh, not installed by default, so that's in the universe repository, yeah? Correct. Um, now, presumably that's a prerequisite to becoming a core developer where you look after the one stuff that's in the main repository. Now, how, I mean, what, what's, how do you actually um, get approved to be a core developer? Well, first off, Motu isn't a prereq. You can go straight to core dev. Mm -hmm. Yeah, if you're an employee of Canonical, you come for example. In and you do nothing but work on the kernel, why would you need Motu? Right. Oh, uh, yeah. You know what I mean? Um, yeah. 
uh, core dev is, I mean, on the Motu console side, when we interview the core developer applicants, we pretty much do it the same way as we do Motu. Um, because that's only part one. Part two is they got to go to the tech board now and get hammered by those guys. And when I say hammered, I mean hammered. All right. Um, they really get into stuff. And, um, yeah, the tech board's scary, to be honest. So, what, like going, asking very deeply technical questions about development and packaging and stuff before you, you know, and make sure you understand the process, that kind of thing. Right. Happen. Yeah, I mean, and, and they'll hammer, I mean, really, really deep on stuff. So, I mean, if, if you... You know, when you go do your core dev application, one thing I recommend is do not be general at all. I mean, be right to the point, be precise. Because if you're general, you know, say, I can say, I've worked on a package and patched GCOM. Boy, before you know it, they're asking me all kinds of GCOM questions, and I'm just, I'm nailed, I'm hammered, I don't know what to do. <laughs> right. Okay, so you've really got to know your stuff um, in order to get through the, the technical board. Um, right, but you, you, what are the specific aspects that you're looking at on, on when you're doing your evaluation? How do you tell who'd be a good person that they participated in the community? Or right, well, most of the time, people that are going for core developer, most of us have worked with over the years. Um, I mean, on all the applicants that we've done for core de devs, nobody has. You know, it hasn't been somebody we haven't known or we, you know, we had to really go, okay, who's this person and whatnot. They, you know, we've known these people. We know they do good work. Um, and we know that the technical board's going to approve them. Um, there has been an occasion where we let them go through and a technical board didn't approve them only because that person was general on their application and when they were going through the tech board, the tech board hammered them on one point. So Right. There's yeah, we. I mean, we we're technical when we do our our stuff with the Motu Council, um, without a doubt. Most of the stuff, you know, we pretty much know the people already, so it it makes it much easier on our part. And there are some people, as I understand it, there's 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 Motu, there's Core, and there's some people who have an exception. So they 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 only maintain one package in Core, that, right? Isn't um, it? So, for example, like the Wine Project, there's like one package or one guy who maintains that and he's not necessarily a core developer but he can maintain that package is that right right he just has access right to that package yeah um, there's another one too i think emacs is the other one <laughs> <laughs> um, okay we're actually working on an applicant now that's trying to get upload rights for one package i can't remember what package it is um we haven't done much of it to be honest so the policy around it, I know Davey loves policies and, and stuff like that, so <laughs> the policy around it is, is actually still being designed as we're actually approving people. Um, it's all going to change with the archive reorg, and I know I should not. I just stuck my foot in my mouth with that one. You guys yeah, know? because actually, we're going to ask you about that. Yeah, yeah. 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 yeah, because archive reorg, that's something that's been uh, discussed for a little while now, isn't it? I have no idea what that is. But hang on. Um, uh, well, before we go on to that, can I just um, ask one more thing? Um, so there's, so we, we've been talking about Motu, you know, so you bunch of developers and you bunch of core developers. Right. Um, now, so, something I think we might interest our listeners is what What's the difference between uh, a developer for Ubuntu and a, a and like an upstream developer for, for another project? So, I mean, I, I mean, do, do they actually work on the code, or is it just the packaging? I mean, how, how does that work? Now, when you say developer, um, you're also the way that I look at it is anybody who does any type of development work, whether it's community development, artwork development, documentation development, code development, package development. You're a developer in my eyes. Right. Um, so uh, the difference really, I mean, and the same thing goes with an upstream developer. Um, the big difference between a, a downstream or a distribution developer is a distribution developer, a lot of people see them as just someone who's doing the packaging. So really, they're nothing more than a, I shouldn't say nothing more, but they're, they're just <laughs> Gates have been trouble there. You know what I mean? Yeah, right. And upstream developers, you know, are people that, well, you know, the, the common misconception, I guess I should say, is, they're the people who are writing the code. But a developer is anybody who's developing anything, anywhere, that's helping the community or the project itself. Right. So that's where I have one of my stuff. Okay, so um, you, you, you touched on the Encore Reorg there. Oh, man, here we go. Can, can, I, mean, I mean, as I was saying, that's something's been planned for a while now. Uh, can't you tell us a bit about what it is and, and how it's going to work? No. no Excellent. Um, how it's going to work? Oh, man. The Archive Reorg is... Um, we're going to reorganize the thing where you're not going to have like your main universe and everything. All the packages are going to be in, in one archive. 
And what this does now is, like we were just talking about how we, how Wine has a, um, one person who can work on the packaging and upload and whatnot. Well, that's going to be the main thing about, about uh, the, not the main thing, but one of the big things about the Archive Reorg is like the Kubuntu project. We don't have to send people, once it's complete, if it ever gets complete, which I'm sure it will <laughs> soon. But when it does is, now we get people coming in and, and working on Kubuntu, we don't have to send them to become a Motu so they can get upload rights to Universe, which really doesn't help Kubuntu much because we really need core devs. Excuse me. So, you know, we don't have to send them that whole process. What we can do is Kubuntu is say, hey, listen, we have this whole, and the names aren't even, I don't even know what you want to call them. I called it a snowflake at UDS out in Mountain View. So um, it's kind of like the seeds for Kubuntu. We can give a person rights to work on the Kubuntu packages only, and it's you know, it. Um, so it's a lot more atomic. You you have right. teams who are looking after um, uh, packages which are related to each other in terms right. of functionality, rather than grouped together by right. very high level, you know, main universe and so on. Yeah, and I mean that could all change. We you know, it's, the talks have been going on forever. I've been in on on. Uh, on conference calls with, um, you know, Canonical and stuff like that, working on this whole thing, and boy, my eyes crossed. You don't know how many times during all those conversations. So it's not something that's going to happen anytime soon, within the next, say, six months or so? Uh, six months? I hope so. Uh, it oh, really? should. But we also said that at Mountain View. Uh, <laughs> so, so Richard, is it is there, would there be potential there for you actually to lose your upload rights to say um, GNOME or GNOME uh, packages because obviously yeah. you're mainly focused on Kubuntu? Yeah. So, so would you yeah, actually there's, have that privilege that taken away? Um, one of the things we had brought up when we were at it, at UDS and Mountain View on the on the back end side, on like the community management side with the Motu Council and the Tech Board, is. Um, what do we do about people that are core developers right now, or Motu, that you know have access to an entire repository? Um, once this kicks in, you know, it, you know, I, if they switch me to Kubuntu, I lose access to working on, on non-Kubuntu stuff, which I don't know how much of that there is out there that I've actually worked on. So there's, you know, possibly there's going to be some people that are going to keep that, you know, keep the entire rights to everything. Um, isn't, yeah, isn't there, I, there is potential that I lose my rights to everything, which is no biggie since I work mostly on, on KDE stuff, and I have no problem poking people, telling them to upload stuff for me. I did it for two years before I even thought about becoming Motu, so... Isn't there going to be a lot of crossover? So, for example, there's like a GNOME Bluetooth applet and a KDE Bluetooth applet, and then there's the core Bluetooth stuff underneath. Right. And there's going to have to be a lot of cross-communication between those people who look after those three separate things, if they are indeed separate teams of people. Which, which is something that you brought up a great point there. Is It's something I hope happens right there. Because in the past with Kubuntu, and I mean, it's, you know, it's Kubuntu's fault just as much as anybody else's. Our, you know, our cross-communication has been... <laughs> null and void really there hasn't been much with Karmic now we've actually been working really close with uh, GNOME developers um, the Ubuntu developers with the was it Ayatana the desktop uh -huh. craziness um, <laughs> we've been working with those guys and if you read Jonathan Riddle's blog here recently he posted one of the first things from that come out of the Ayatana project for KDE um, with Karmic uh, yeah we've been working closely with GNOME developers Ubuntu developers and uh, and yeah, it's something that I wish that had been going on for a long time. Hmm. Now, just before we wrap up, um, I see on your webpage that you talk about you're an associate member of the Free Software Foundation. Um, huh. Do you still think... <laughs> <laughs> okay, right. I was going to ask what you th why, you th um, why you went ahead and became an associate member and, w and whether you think the Free Software Foundation is still relevant today. Well... Let me just start off and say I let it expire. Uh-huh. I like your Ubuntu membership, apparently. <laughs> <laughs> right. Um, I have no problem with the Free Software Foundation. There's, they have a ton of great people, amazing people, and they have a lot of good ideas. The only problem is, you know, they've done stuff like uh, this whole Bad Vista campaign. Mm -hmm. They come out and say it was a win. Um, I don't know who it was a win for because I sure in the heck didn't feel like I won anything. Mm -hmm. Um and I'm seeing more rhetoric than I am good coming out of there now. And, you know, I, like someone like uh, Benjamin Mako Hill, I would love to see him become, like, the leader of the whole thing because that guy is brilliant. Mm -hmm. um, Stallman, I'm a Stallman fan. You know, I'm, I'm not going to lie about that. But he, 
is confusing about as much as George W. Bush was. <laughs> <laughs> That's probably a good place to leave that, I think. Yes. Well, well, I, th- I think no, we've probably gonna, talked I'm to you. I'm going to take hell for that. So. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think we've probably talked to you all day, but I, I guess we better cut it there. Um, so, thanks very much, Richard. Um, it's been a pleasure speaking to you. And, well, it's uh, not over yet. I have to fix you guys on something. Oh, um, yeah, go on. I'll look out. Your last podcast, you called it the Kubuntu Netbook Remix. <laughs> yeah, uh, right. Okay. Davey knows because I gave him hell on IRC. Oh, that's good. <laughs> yeah. It's actually the Kubuntu Netbook Edition, so it's... Um, okay, it's official. Awesome stuff. I'm actually running it right now on my little Inspiron Mini 10V. Is, is that KD 4.3? Um, right now it's 4.3. Um, actually, the netbook edition that's being worked on upstream in KDE um, that a lot of the Kubuntu developers are actually helping with is being built for 4.4. So we've had to go in and um, you know hack up the libs a little bit so we can get it to work um, with 4.3. I'm running it right now. It's pretty impressive. I'm missing a few things, but um, you know we still have time to work stuff out. Uh, so this the whole network mangler thing is getting on my nerves. The <laughs> <laughs> whole network management applet. That's a pretty everyday occurrence, uh, surely. The only one that works. So for the geeks here, um, the difference between a remix and an edition is what? I find you have to ask that question. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, you you called us on it on it being yeah, a, a right. remix or an edition and not, and we got it wrong. So tell us right, what right, the right. difference is. Um, yeah, um, there's differences. What they are, I really don't know. Um, no, um, the whole containment for one in the netbook edition isn't running on top of like the regular KDE desktop like UNR does. Right. Moving through netbook um, remix, how they have that little thing that just sets on the desktop. Right. Yes. This is like uh, an entire containment. So the nice thing about KDE is the containment. So you have a desktop containment that we use. You know, everybody's pretty much familiar with. So for the netbooks, we have a containment for it. That's a whole netbook one. Um, it looks. It's got that netbooky feel, I guess you would say as Mario from Dell put it the other day on IRC to me. Um, the one thing that we're trying to do with the the netbook edition for KDE is try to make it so it doesn't take up so much screen real estate like um, the other ones are, like Jolly Cloud or Moblin. So you're not going to have lots of big clocks. Remix, all that stuff, so. <laughs> what was that? I'm not going to have lots of big clocks and a great big panel. Um, you know, there was one great big clock when I first fired it up. <laughs> Fuzzy <laughs> clock, yay! <laughs> um, um, and I removed that clock. I got on my nerves. Yeah. He, and was that was that uh, Alan? I just brought up the whole clock thing. Yes. Yeah, I have a bone to pick with you too, oh, Mister. <laughs> UDS Mountain View. Yeah. You were out on the steps, so happy with your KDE4 laptop. Yeah. And dude, like the next podcast you guys do, I've gone back. That yeah. was. I think that was about two months later. Probably two and a half. podcast, and I could totally see you with the, with your tail between your legs on that one. I was like, no. I, I had I had Kubuntu on my laptop for a good couple of months. This is when you committed to run it for six months, no yep. matter what. Yep. And then right. it just I just found myself getting so frustrated with it. Right, right. It's the same thing when I when when I use GNOME. It's the same thing. But I run GNOME. My, I'm looking at GNOME on my desktop now. Actually, at the KDE website. No. <laughs> but uh. <laughs> Yeah, I, I find myself getting, you know, the same way. I get flustered with, with some of the stuff. You know, it's, you're not used to it. Yeah. Yeah, Alan's quite easily um, confused by technology. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's, yeah, I understand. So. Well, well, th- thanks for helping keep KD contained. And um, <laughs> it was, <laughs> and uh, so, so that, that was really good. Well, thanks, thanks so, Richard. Yeah, thanks for talking to us. Thank you so much. Same, same here, guys. time for the news. Two Google security experts discovered a flaw which affects eight years worth of Linux kernels. The bug could allow a local user on a Linux system to gain root privileges. It's been patched for future kernels, but clearly there's a lot of potentially affected systems in the wild. Mm. Well, I think it's worth noting that it's a local exploit, so you actually already have to have an account on the actual server Mm. in order to be able to do it. So if it's shared hosting or something. Yeah. If you you run like a, a... Dreamhost. Yeah. I was going to say, I bet Dreamhost have a bit of a panic attack at the moment. Yeah. And most other ISPs that have any kind of web space that yeah. gives v- you a shell account. VPSs well, for the win. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I, I, I did actually try an example exploit code uh, on Jaunty, and that wasn't vulnerable, but someone else I saw reported that it was. So. I see, um, yeah, Case Cook, who works with the security team, has replied that all um, Ubuntu releases since 804 
are not vulnerable oh, and then right. gives a description of why in some technical mm. detail. Watch out for your updates then. ID Software have announced that Quake Live is now available for Mac and Linux. Nightmare. Oh, as well as Windows. Nightmare. Why? <laughs> well, Quake was the first game I ever played on a PC and I got horribly addicted to Quake Live. <laughs> horribly uh. addicted. Actually, I have to agree. Uh, Half-Life was the very first game I tried on network play. And I was playing people for about, you know, 10 minutes and talking and saying, look, come on, guys, you know, come on. And then realised I was actually playing bots. Do you know, the, <laughs> re- the really sad thing is my first network game, I think, was Rogue. NetHack on, over Telnet? It was Rogue on terminals at a company that would let you run it for two hours at lunchtime. <laughs> and then the, the programme was switched off after two hours. Terrible. I'm not that old. Canonical and the Ubuntu Firefox maintainers got a bit of a kicking from Karmic users last week. The objections centred around an experiment conducted by the Ubuntu Mozilla team, uh, which modifies the Google search options in the browser to use the custom search engine. The change has now been reverted as the experiment ended. Yay! What was yes. the custom search engine? Well, if if you um, <laughs> you know you can put a custom search engine on your website, you can go to <laughs> Google and and um, get some code to put on your website so that you have a little search box, and so right. people can search either your site or the whole internet using that thing, right? Yeah. Well, if you ever use one of those, you'll notice that you don't get the full Google experience. So when you type yeah. something in and search, you don't get images, news, groups, and all that kind of stuff along the it's, top. It's Google without all the good stuff. Yeah, it's Google yeah. minus Google, basically. <laughs> Google Lite. And what they did was they put that in all of the methods that you search. So if you type something directly in the bra- in the in the awesome bar, or if you type in the little Google thing in the top right-hand corner, or the home page which incidentally was hardwired in the browser. Yes. So when you open a new tab, you get a Google search page. You, you always get the custom search engine, and it, it was kind of horrible. Free software is all about choice. Well, it wasn't... It, it was the, hard-coded. The, the main problem was that it, it... I mean, it was implemented as a plugin, so you could undo it. You could turn it off. But some people didn't like the fact that Ubuntu were in some way tracking what they were searching for. Oh, no, that wasn't an issue for me. The issue for me is I choose not to use that version of Google I want to use the Google as intended full Google yeah Yeah. and the fact that it override my choice from the home settings yeah even if even if you change your home page in the browser it 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 overwrote that yeah yeah that really but anyway it's all gone away yay good Every Ubuntu defector's favourite distro, Arch Linux, have put out a new release, version 2009.09. Boasting an all-new installer and many bug fixes, this version is sure to be useful for all those who see Ubuntu as far too mainstream. So, who's used Arch Linux here? I tried it once. Nope. I'm and not. the installer annoyed me because it was really old school. It looked like a BSD installer. This was last year. What? And when I finished the install, it gave me a static IP address. What's its USP? Uh, it's. Um, I think it's supposed to be um, more. You can have the option of having rolling updates, so you don't have like you don't necessarily have to have not a release and stick. To like it. They do. They do have releases. Keeps going. But you you could potentially have rolling releases. In some ways that's nice. Mm. Yeah, I'm sure it is. Yeah. After a lengthy kerfuffle, it seems Debian have backtracked on their plan to have time-based freezes. We reported on this in the last episode. In the latest Debian news announcement for version 6, codenamed Squeeze, the release team have announced that a new timeline will be announced in early September. (laughs) They've announced they're going to announce it. Yes. Um, Yeah, so they're obviously not... I think they thought they wouldn't be able to have all the necessary work done in time for the December freeze this time around, because it was only four months away at the time they announced it. Okay, so they may well announce a time freeze... For in the future, in the future. So, yeah. so it's not a complete backtrack it's possibly just a yeah. you reckon postponement who knows mm. I haven't read some of it I think it's a lot of um, sacked off Debian developers who really don't want to um, tow somebody else's line mm. Mm. what That's they the really need is somebody to loan them an extra load of developers talking of which Mark Shuttleworth has offered the services of Ubuntu developers to Debian in an effort to help two projects work together closer he says there's no secret cabal or skunk work efforts to influence Debian. Mm. Now, the interesting thing is, is the technical board are actually looking for a prominent Debian developer to be a member as well, aren't they? That makes some sense. That that's makes a lot of sense, actually. That's a really good idea. 
Yes. They already have at least one. Well, that's it. I mean, Colin Watson is say, a Debian Colin, developer. And he's the Ubuntu installer guy, and he was the Debian installer guy. I, I don't know if that's what he's still doing. He, that's part of what that's he does, yes. That's part of what he does, okay. But there were a lot of uh, De- Debian developers who started to work on Ubuntu and, and kept putting stuff back into Debian. So, oh, well, I mean, it's good, you know, support both projects at once. Why not? Go for it. Yeah. Microsoft has been banned from selling Word in the US due to a patent dispute. The banning order, which is expected to be appealed, uh, does not cover other elements of Office, um, but it's expected to cause a software giant a headache for a few months. Presumably until they write a massive check to somebody. Well, it is already a massive amount they have to pay. Mm. Really. Well, not to them, but... $20 million? Yeah, uh, something like that. I thought and it was there, there is also a daily fee as well. Yeah, that's right. Every day they, uh, they have to pay this other company some money. But the but the, the thing is that I've noticed on some main lists, a lot of people are praising this, like, ha-ha, you know. But I actually see this as a bad thing because we're always arguing that we don't like software patents. Yep. And yet when it's actually enforced... Against Microsoft, that makes it all right. Exactly. It's somewhat hypocritical. Yeah. yeah. It, it doesn't make it okay, but maybe... Oh, well. It's okay. a taste of their own medicine. It's a taste of, of their thing. own medicine. Maybe it might make them change their ways. Yeah, you know, right. Like, Never. Yeah. It can happen. Dell's senior product marketing manager, Todd Finch, has said that there's no great disparity between returns of Dell notebooks, between those shipped with Windows and those shipped with Linux. And the Linux is Ubuntu, isn't it? Uh, yes. Yes. On the M10. M9, yeah. M10. So all these yeah. things that people have been saying, oh, well, people send back more Linux machines than, than Windows machines. Well, maybe not. Yeah, it's just, just displacing some FUD. I think. I, I, yeah. I think in many ways it's the selling practice. Yeah, we've talked uh, about this before, the people in the stores. And there was a mention on the, the UK mailing yeah, list, a guy was. who said the guy in the store was uh, actively telling him, you don't want Windows, uh, you don't want Linux, you can't download stuff on Linux, and, you know, all kinds of wacky stuff. Yeah. It was just, you know, it's just someone being clueless. It's not, I don't necessarily think it's malicious, but it's just they haven't necessarily had the training or the experience. Well, you won't be able to download anything on Windows 7 if they're not shipping a browser. <laughs> Computer World have published an article called Seven Reasons to Skip Windows 7. Here's a summary. We'll link to the full article in the show notes as usual. Number one, it's still a security mess. Number two, it's expensive. Number three, upgrading generally means a reinstall, not an in-place upgrade. Number four, no easy way to transfer programs from old to new install. Number five, XP already works. Number six, new user interface. Number seven, contrary to what people say, it does suck on netbooks. (laughs) Yeah, it's a kind of pro... Pro Linuxy in some ways, in, yeah. also pro XP. To be I, I haven't actually read this article, but looking at the actual summary, I'm not sure it's going to be completely unbiased. Actually, unbiased in what way? Well, uh, as in, uh, I, I, as you say, I think it is po- possibly written by a Linux advocate. Oh, the guy does say in the last paragraph, um, he suggests XP users should migrate to Linux and not Windows Seven. So, which in, we also have a new interface. Yeah, but that's the point. It, you know, if whether it's a new interface on Windows Seven or a new interface on Ubuntu, that's only one of the um, the seven reasons not to use it. Yeah. Okay. And it's not expensive because Linux isn't expensive. It's not a security mess unless you've got one of these vulnerable kernels that's been around for the last eight years. <laughs> um, upgrading means well, you can't up- well you can upgrade from release to release, but you have to do some sort of installation and partitioning effort. Um, you can transfer your settings because the um, Wubi, if you use Wubi, it'll pick up your settings from Windows and transfer that across. Uh-huh. That's it. So that's that one. And um, XP it, it does works. suck on networks potentially. What Ubuntu? Yeah, sucks on mine. Oh, okay, so slow. Well, that's one or two selling points. Sarcasm overload. (laughs) So we have some events. We've got the Software Freedom Day. This year is Saturday, the 19th of September, 2009. Oz Bar Camp is also on the 19th of September in Dublin. And uh, some of us are going to be there. Yeah, I'm going and producer Laura is going. And I know some of you here have still yet to get the necessary permission from other (laughs) halves to attend. We we need our permission slips. Yeah. Yes. Hopefully uh, somebody else will be there as well. But yeah, it should be good, good fun. Also, also on the 19th of September, there's the Atlanta Linux Fest at the IBM facility on Northside Parkway. So hang on, I have to do Software Freedom Day, then go to Ireland, then go to America all in the same day. You can try. Think of the air miles. You can be like Phil Collins at Live Aid. He does look quite a lot like Phil Collins. This has been said before. LinuxCon, the new technical conference for all matters Linux, is running on the 21st to 23rd of September in Portland, Oregon. We've got Ohio Linux Fest, which is the 25th to the 26th of September. 
at the Greater Columbus Convention Center in downtown Columbus, Ohio. There's going to be a Launchpad community meetup on the 28th of September in London. And we've got the Ubuntu Global Jam on the 2nd to the 4th of October. Lug Radio Live 2009 is on the 24th of October at New Hampton Arts Centre in Wolverhampton. And we did mention this very briefly in the last episode, but we're probably worth well, mentioning in a little more depth. Um, we've been talking with the Linux Outlaws guys, who are another Linux-related podcast. Um, <laughs> you might have heard of. You might have. <laughs> they're very good. Um, I listened to an episode and they were really good. Um, <laughs> I mean that in a nice way. But, uh, yeah, anyway. Um, yeah, so we've been talking with them about having some sort of joint uh, unconference or bar camp type event on the Sunday, the day after the Log Radio Live, so that's Sunday the 25th. Um, it'll be in Wolverhampton, so it'll be around, so if you've come for the Log Radio Live on the Saturday and gone out in the evening, hopefully you can still hang around for a bit on the Sunday. We've had a few tweets and a few dents saying people might like to turn up, um, but if you're interested and just would like to say, yes, that's a good idea, it'd be really good to kind of gauge how many people might like to turn up. Um, so email us or voicemail us or tweet us or dent us or whatever it might be and just say, yeah, that sounds like a good idea. Um, and then yes, we'll know. just say those words. That's all you sounds need like to say. a good idea. And then sounds like a fun packed weekend and uh, we know it's worth uh, putting the effort in to organise there is a comedy gig for, for the benefit of Bletchley Park in Bloomsbury Theatre in London on Tuesday 3rd of November with Richard Herring Robert Llewellyn Crichton Robin Ince and maybe Stephen Fry excellent so this is to raise money for Bletchley Park because it keeps having Keep its funding yes. yeah. Ble- Bletchley Park was the thing that did the co-breaking for the, uh, for the, the World, World War, War yeah, and the uh, Enigma machines mm. and finally Fosdem is on the 6th and 7th of February 2010 in Brussels it's time for some more command line love with the one and only Simon oh it's not love it's love love <laughs> command line love late dear night command me, line love dear me are we going to get told off by the people who run commandlinefood.org or whatever it is uh, probably only if they listen well it is a resource uh, and that's where most of these come from but we know we're just um, <laughs> we're just blatantly blagging other people's content <laughs> well there's that we have had a few suggestions from the community members though yeah. a oh, few okay, tips and things so they're not all stolen <laughs> They're borrowed under a <laughs> liberal license. Come on, IP rights for command line food. This is true. Oh, we, We're talking yeah. of IP. So what are you going to serve up for us this time? Right. This time is a couple, um, two in fact. Obviously, most applications come with uh, a manual. Um, you go into the terminal, type man and then whatever your app name is, and you get a text manual on mm-hmm. the application. Um, that's great, but what about if you... Um, some people can't actually read and take in the information from a screen. I actually struggle with it quite a lot. Yeah. I need to see it on paper. And mm-hmm. some of the man pages are gigantic. Yeah. And you've got to scroll through pages of stuff. So not particularly environmentally friendly, but you can, in fact, convert the manuals to uh, a text file or, in fact, a PDF. Uh, and once you've done that, you can print them off. Ah. And if you're not that environmentally unfriendly, hang on, double negative. No, that's right, you're it, good. Yeah. <laughs> and maybe you have an ebook reader or an OLPC that can act as a... Uh, ebook ready then you can put PDFs on that can't you and the thing is you actually showed me this a few days ago and I hadn't actually used this before and I was really pleased to actually include the formatting as well it's really useful oh yeah. wow yeah, yeah, yeah. it doesn't just create like a standard mm-hmm. sort of courier font or anything like that it actually has the bolds yeah. and the oh nice you know, it, it looks quite nicely between. laid out yeah hmm. so you can uh, make your own O'Reilly books <laughs> <laughs> cheeky <laughs> We've got a great title for this next segment. You may have heard something similar on the television called Who Do You Think You Were? Oh, I thought it was going to be Come Dancing. No, no that's later. That's right. <laughs> really? <laughs> Just horrendous. Um, so I had, I had a thought the other day. Um, when you started in the Linux world, or when you started getting to Linux, you sort of were new to the idea. Perhaps you went along to a lug meeting and you saw all the people who were there, or you had to kind of beliefs... You know, if you if you went if you came into Linux because of the whole free software thing, and that was what attracted you to it, or maybe you got into it for a pragmatic reason. And we've all been knocking around in the community for a long time now, probably four, five, six, maybe getting on for ten years in some of our cases. Um, have we changed over that period? Are we different people now? We've got different values or motivations or priorities. We're doing what we do in terms of Linux. We're kind of still doing the same sort of thing, but do we do it a different way? Have we have we mellowed in our views? Alan, how, were you, how did you get into Linux and, and what were your motivations when you started? Uh, I first used it as a 
um, on a, a CD that came with a book. I, do you know, I really can't remember what... Oh, I know the first guy who said it, told me about Linux was a guy at where I worked. He was a student at where I worked. And he said, oh, you've got to try this new thing called um, Linux. And it's really great. And he said it came on 36 floppy disks or something. <laughs> and I was like, get out. I'll never take off. But equally... Um, within a, a couple of months of that, one of the lecturers there said, oh, there's this new fantastic Windows. So that's really fantastic. And I went, get out of that. So I am <laughs> clearly no good at predicting the future. <laughs> <laughs> this Windows thing will never take off. <laughs> exactly. That's pretty much what I said to him. What a fool. So do you think you were a, a very different person in terms of your outlook on Linux when you started getting into it? Um, I think I thought it was deeply technical. I think I thought the whole thing was just... Um, I thought Unix at the time was hard because I'd never really touched it. Mm. And I think I thought it was just really madly geeky. And I think now I still think it is. Okay. Do you I, think... was, I thought you were going to say something like, now I think no. anybody can use it. <laughs> yeah, no, I, no, yeah, you're right. I do think it's still madly geeky because you have communities of people who turn up and take computers apart once a month and, <laughs> you know, and sit around in a room and talk about, you know, drivers and compilers and stuff. So it is still deeply technical, mm. but it's more accessible. Do you there think, are other people. Do you think that was one of the driving forces of why you actually got involved in Linux was because you thought it was very geeky? Probably, yeah. I, I I felt um an affinity with the people who because they were they you know, they were similar minded, you know, they were also nerds, you know, yeah that, that you know. I mean I, I can certainly relate to that. I think it's because um I think some people have um part of their personality to want to succeed at doing something well. And and <laughs> and we clearly don't. No no no, <laughs> no I, 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 I put myself into that group. Um, so I'm, um, so I, I work, I, I work hard to try and get good at something. If I'm interested in something, I work hard to get good at it. And I'm sure most people do, but now I'm actually at a stage that I don't, I'm not sure I actually value someone else's geekiness to the same level, unless they actually use a, a Linux or Unix, um, variant. Ah, so you're a geek snob. I, I guess I, and the, 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 I must say that is a fault with me, but I'm always a bit mm. skeptical of someone else's experience. But I don't, I don't think that's, uh, mm, yeah, I can, I can see that. I, I've, I've met people who've never known pre windows. So for example, windows system admin who would have started doing system admin, maybe about the era of windows 98 or NT or something like that. So basically young people. Mm. And you know, you've talked to them about stuff like, um, DOS and HiMem and EMM386 and all these words that, you know, you conjure images of horrid configurations and DOS and Windows and stuff. And I, and I think, oh, you've, you've missed all that. You've missed that, that good stuff and you're, you're missing out. Aren't you amazed that, pe- that some people don't actually know there's a console on, on, the, on their computer? I mean, for me, I mean, in older versions of Windows, the console was, was a, a certain, a, an important part. But but now you don't see it at all unless you explicitly look for it on a Windows computer. So, same question to you then, Dave, as as we went to Alan. What were you doing when you first started to get into Linux? Well, (laughs) I actually had to check my wiki page, which is horribly out of date. But yes, I I, I actually started using uh, Linux 10 years ago this year. Yeah. Wow! Okay. And it was actually in the summer because I remember the very first time I, I was it was a national newspaper and there was a, a com- sort of a computer column and it said, "Hey, this is this free thing that's just taking off," and that was actually Slackware I tried. Wow! Yeah. So it's the summer now. So it is literally, literally pretty much ten years since you yeah, started. Yeah, it is. It is. And I actually remember <laughs> um, directly after I installed it, all I got was this black screen. Yeah, and I had no. I, I didn't even know how to log in. You know. So what, what, I mean? what was it that appealed to you? Why did you think this might be something interesting <laughs> to try out? With just geekiness? Or? I think so. I think so. And it's something I wanted to get good at. But I was actually. If you let me finish my story, sorry. Don't mind. <laughs> yeah. So so just after I logged in, um, I didn't actually know what to do. All I got was this black screen. I wasn't even aware there was a desktop there until one of my friends who. Uh, who who has been using it for a couple of weeks? It said, "Dave, try typing start x." <laughs> and I thought, "Oh wow, you know this is actually you know it, it's, okay. it's 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 certainly come on leaps and bounds." But anyway, okay, I'm ready to answer your second question, Tony. Okay, well, so you were doing proprietary software development and things. In, yeah. in the past, but now you work pretty much exclusively with well, Linux and free software systems. It, and it has definitely taken over my life in that respect because you know I did um, work uh, doing. Uh, 
C++ and Java programming yeah. on, on a Windows desktop. And a couple of years ago, I decided to, you know, that I thought I was at a stage that I could um, probably match or, or exceed my income mm. doing something I actually enjoy. And, and that's working with Linux servers and, 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 other, and other related things. You're living the dream, really. Well, <laughs> you say that, but, you know, I mean, you like, you like pizza, yeah? Yeah. But have you worked in a pizza shop? Yeah. Uh, okay. Fair <laughs> so so what, what advice would you give your, your younger self if you could? Would you say, don't oh, do it? Do I, it? Would, I would actually, I mean, I think it's such an exciting time at the moment. I, if, I, if I could just get started with it now... I think you know things have come on so much. I mean, just in processing it and actually you know, computer power alone. If you could come in now, because I, there, there's no doubt in my mind, there's things that took me, you know, months to actually pick up. That actually people coming into it now, it, it's so accessible that they can pick up. And you know, I think that people could come to the same sort of level we're at um, within a, a couple of months, whereas it's taken us years. I don't know. I'm not so sure about that. I think you, I think you get. It's the same. Uh, you still need that backfill of experience. I, I would say, I would say to the person I was all those years ago when the guy came up to me with thirty floppy disks, take them and play with it, because I didn't. And I, I think I was. I think I'm late to the party. And I started using Linux six years ago, maybe more. Yeah, but all the cool people turn up late to a party. It's fashionably <laughs> late. Simon, what about you? I've been thinking whilst you lot have been waffling on, actually. Um, <laughs> Cheers. There were, I can't put a date on it, but I remember my first distro, and that was Red Hat 5. I wow. think that's around about eight years ago-ish. I'm just thinking, trying to think back. But that'd it, be longer it, than no, that. No, that'd be longer than that, because I was on Red Hat 7 in 2000 or thereabouts. Red Hat 7 came out when I was at uni, and that was really? 10 years ago. Well, anyway... It, it, You're it older mainly, than you think you are. Yeah, I'm not. I'm not. <laughs> it stemmed from, from two real areas i've always had a problem with ripped off software and i was of course using ripped off software at the time and mm. it never ever it, it's never sat well uh, and that was one driving force but i really wasn't aware of um free and open source software at the time what really got me into linux was the fact that um, i am a radio ham and um i wanted to set up a, a bulletin board um which, of course, were running all over the internet at the time. Well, Radio Hams were running them um, linked into those um, online bulletin boards over the air, and I wanted to run one. And one of the best bits of software was um, written by a guy called, I can't remember his call sign, F6FBB. <laughs> <laughs> and this stuff ran on Linux. So I got the local um, nerd around. He installed a version of Red Hat. Right. But it was probably pre-alpha because when I tried to do anything other than run the, the BBS software, it, re- it was horrible. It really, really didn't work at all. That sounds just like Linux was oh, at man. that time. Uh, yeah, really. you're probably right. But um, yeah, that was it. Um, and I left the, the bulletin board, sat in the corner doing its thing, and I'd log in and you know look after it a couple of times a day. Liked it, got Red Up 5, installed it, and, and yeah, that was it. Um, we've all had to learn from scratch. There was always a time where none of us in this room had used Linux and we started and we've learned it, but you've been quite public both on this podcast and sort of blogs and things about your learning process in terms of get out to Linux. Would you give yourself any advice yourself when you started out? Um, no, actually I think I've done it fairly well in that I, I went to the people with the knowledge and the people mm. were the lug yeah. and I pestered and I poked and I said to Bo P cause he was the friendly guy. So, <laughs> Mate, mate, can you tell me how to do this? Guy. Can you tell me how to do that? How things have changed. I, oh, no. <laughs> I, I remember the first time I met Simon at a lug meet, he was sat behind me about so three funny. three feet away, and we were talking to each other on IRC in the Hans IRC channel, and I said, yeah, where are you, mate? And he went, turn around. <laughs> so, it was oh, love, so it was love at first sight. Yeah. Well, it was, it was great. Something because... about beards. <laughs> He would help. He would help. And as I said earlier on, he would help to the point where he was, it was not a case of, I've had enough of helping you. It was a case of, you can find this information for yourself. Google is your friend. And, and that's really, you know. See, you've actually picked on something in a personality there. Because, um, I mean, I think a lot of geeks don't actually like to ask for help, you know, if, if they can. So I think sometimes when you get to a certain stage... Um, you actually want to try and find that out yourself rather than keep asking people. I think that's just the, the technical people that we either were or become because of the power. That's the other thing with, I'm not, with Linux. I'm not convinced it is that people don't want to ask questions. I think it's that people lack 
the correct skills to be able to ask the right questions of the right people in the right way. Yeah, yeah, because I mean, I mean, clearly there's no need to spend a, a whole day doing something when someone could tell you in 10 minutes. Oh, no, oh I don't know. There are some belligerent people out there who will sit there for a whole day hacking away at something and then you come over and go, just type this. Yeah, I'm hiding. Yeah, but in that, in that, uh, in that day of searching and trying so hard to get something to work, you learn so much. Mm. It depends on where you're coming from. If you just want to be a user and get on with it, that's not what you should be doing. But we're obviously all quite technical people and enjoy getting into the guts of things. It's part of the fun now. Mm. So the same question to you, Tony. Okay. We, we, I mean, we all met through the lug. Yes. I met you first at yeah. Portsmouth College, I think. At I never went meeting. to Portsmouth College meeting. No, I met oh. you at Southampton. But oh, okay. I, I remember Alan having been shown how to install Debian. Yeah, system. that was when I had... Yeah, I was on Red Hat previously, yeah, and yeah. everyone badgered me to use Debian. I remember you sitting there watching all the, uh, the D-package stuff scrolling past, going, look at what he's doing, he's doing stuff. <laughs> I was so I used to installing that. one package, then going and finding yeah, the dependencies, one, yeah. and then doing one more. Yeah, But I... I, I obviously, I'm a, I'm a geek, and I got into Linux because of the technical stuff, and I like... What I really liked about it was the ability to kind of do... customize it and tweak it to your own satisfaction. I used to... When I used to look after our family PC at home, we had, we had Windows 98, sort of tweak the boot scripts and stuff to get the settings right and so that try and help protect my parents from destroying the system. I'd hide certain icons so that when I started it, it would do it would show me all the icons and they'd only have the ones they wanted to use. So, And then when sort of XP in 98 came along, it was harder to do that because there wasn't any user separation and things. So I really liked the idea of a system that would give me max control and almost endless tweakability. So I love the geeky side. But when I started to read about Linux... Um, I started to get into the whole idea of free software and the fact that it would remove the restrictions. As a student, I found it really frustrating that I couldn't install Office and things legally on my yeah. on my uh, home computer. So I couldn't do my university work. I had to go to the university and do uh, use the university computer labs. But I could get Star Office as it was then, and later became Open Office and things, and download that and try to use that. It was a bit ropey, but I was trying to use the things that I was legally allowed to use. And the whole idea of and the logical position of, of free software being able to continue to it's the only logical standpoint to take if you want to remove all restrictions on what people can do with their computers is that everything should be free software. Mm -hmm. And for a while I was kind of like, yes, this must be the case and I will strive to only use free software. But yet I still have a job where I'm a network manager or IT manager in a you know, largely proprietary system with Linux servers undoubtedly and I use a Linux desktop but there's a lot of Windows servers and other sort of you know, proprietary you, you servers. You actually virtualize some Windows servers through Linux don't you? Yeah yeah so we've got some virtual Windows servers and things but I kind of think if I was if I was to sort of talk to myself in 2000 2001 I would have liked to have thought then that I would be doing something that was just Linux now yeah and I'm not, it's still a mixture. I still enjoy doing the Linux stuff and I'm still okay and happy to do the Windows stuff. Yeah, I, 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 I can kind of relate to that. I have that separation of when I go to work, I do evil stuff that pays the bills and mm. keeps my kids in shoes and food. But at the, at, at the end of the work day, I can go and do stuff which is more enjoyable. I actually wrote a blog post about this, I think about three years ago, doing the things I hate to fund <laughs> the things I love, I think I call it. Because... You know the the stuff you do at work a lot of the time is not necessarily for some people is not necessarily mm. as enjoyable as the hacking away on Linux. That is, I f I think Linux has made computing more fun mm. because there's just it's. I know the the comment we had in the feedback or, um, where someone said um, that they they felt difficult. It was difficult moving from Windows to Linux because it's such a leap and he wouldn't know what to do. That is, I think, the best thing about Linux, is there's yeah. so much to Exciting learn. Exciting times, actually, yeah. because when you do get rid of XP and all you've got is Linux, wow. You know, once you can get past the little niggles and you, you realise the power, it's, um, it's exciting times. Yeah. yeah, I do just wonder whether, you know, uh, I, I, I remember when I was young and idealistic, or younger and idealistic, I should say, you know, thinking that, Anybody who didn't around me who didn't understand Linux and free software and see that this was obviously the right thing to do and the only way to go, yeah. I would I would think was just sort of narrow minded or short sighted and, and, and rail against them. And, oh, I'm still like that. Well, I, yeah, but I you're pragmatic though. I'm, you're still pragmatic. You will use, you know, some oh, non-free no, no, no. software. If we're talking or... about people, if we're talking about well, individuals, and when you say, look, look, you know, this 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 one disc is is so 
is, is so powerful, is so trouble free. Why don't you take it and never give it a go? And nah, nah, I'm happy with what I've got. I, I get I get frustrated. I can, really can't help it. I, I agree with that. But for somebody who tells me that, yeah, you know, just like I would be annoyed if somebody told me there was only one way to do something on the server was with a Windows server. I can now see that me saying the only way you should do this on the server oh, is with yes. a Linux server is just as wrong. Whereas back then, I don't think I did. I think sort of the idealistic philosophy sort of overrode any other considerations. And whether I would now see myself now as a bit of a sellout or something, whether I've kind of not really stuck oh, true completely. to that. Yeah. Oh, good. Thanks. <laughs> no, no, no. I'm, I'm agreeing with you in the oh, point right. that you might see yourself now as a bit of a sellout, yeah. as I am. You know, I know people, you know, have a go at me because i went out and bought a mac Mm. you know well the fact is i've got non-free software on my linux laptop and okay i've got an apple which is almost completely you know non-free software but i use firefox and you know other and it's got open office installed on it so i you know there's always these little outposts of free software even in the non-free areas Mm. that i work there's still yeah i mean we are i mean I think by its nature, Ubuntu is a pragmatist uh, distribution. You know, it's for for people who are more willing to sort of, they're they're not hardcore free software people generally. Yeah. I mean, for example, how many people have a free software phone? And now there's no excuse, really. Mm. You know, I mean, how many people who, who, you know, I'm, well, going down that road. But I mean, also on the same subject, uh, I mean, a few years ago, I, I come across, and it's something which is, I do bring up more, probably more than I should, this sort of GNU, or GNU Linux, calling it that rather than Linux. A few years ago, I did actually think, oh, okay, that's what we should do. Yeah. You know, that's what we should do. And then I saw the sort of debates and the sort of... Um, I, I actually went off the actually the idea. So now I don't do that. But yeah. you went off the idea, not because you thought the idea of giving... Ah, uh, no, we're rambling on about something else now, aren't well, we? Well, yeah, it's reasonable. I, but I went off it for a pragmatic idea. And the, the pragmatic thing was it's too long to type. <laughs> and so therefore I sacrificed what I didn't sacrifice my ideals but I sacrificed what might be an idealistic standpoint of including the GNU Linux in it for I'm, I'm more on reasons. I'm more on the side that I think Dave is that it was I I deviated away from the whole GNU slash Linux because I don't think it's as important to credit GNU as it is important to credit all the other packages you know what about um, the guy who wrote uh, known power manager what about the guy who wrote well, the yeah. bluetooth stack what about the guy yeah. who wrote you know this and that yeah you know, these people are also worthy of thanks and i don't i, I don't want to exclude mm. one thing for another yeah yeah i guess just to wrap it up the one thing that i i would tell my younger self would be that actually linux is really going to gain uh, a lot of strength in in the marketplace and you know you'll start to see linux everywhere it'll be in mainstream news articles on the bbc you know, within a few years of you taking it up, not because you took it up, but you know, <laughs> it will go places and it will do stuff and it, and it will really help empower people who do choose to use it. If I could go back 15 years or so, I'd register two domain names, Google and Thought. <laughs> <laughs> Linux.com, surely. <laughs> We're doing the competition now. Um, £20 uh, canonical shop voucher is what the competition was for. And obviously, mm-hmm. we, we spun it around um, and did it slightly differently. It was our back-to-front competition. <laughs> <laughs> so the answer was um, Pulse Audio. And we had some really great entries. Um, yeah, so I thank- think what we're going to do is we're going to uh, read a few out and then we'll pick a winner. Yeah, thanks to everybody who sent their applies in. They gave us a good chuckle or two. Um, the first entry was? That was uh, Craig Cabri. Okay, and Craig's suggestion was, what sound server do many people blame for problems when, in fact, it's ALSA drivers that are the problem? Yeah. Mm. <laughs> uh, is it? Yeah, well, it's strange, because if I have an audio problem and I kill Pulse Audio, I'm still using ALSA, and the problem tends to go away. Sorry, uh, Craig. Uh, apparently, the ALSA stuff hides it. That's what I've Ah, uh, right. Oh, okay, fair enough. Well, it, maybe Craig could give us a voicemail or something and tell us a little bit more about why people blame Pulse Audio when it should be ALSA. Mark Law sent in, um, solve the anagram. I use duo lap. <laughs> nice. That sounds wrong. It's fun does it actually work? thought gone into that. <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah, it does. Yeah. And we had one from Andrew, and he says, what words haunt Daniel Chen's nightmares? Now, he's the guy that, that works on Pulse Audio and stuff, ah, isn't right. he? For Ubuntu, yeah. Ah, right. I didn't want to show my ignorance and say I didn't know who Daniel was. 
Jan Ritka or Jan Ritka, what does a doctor listen to when using a stethoscope? Pulse, Pulse audio. audio. <laughs> ah, now that yes. is good. I like that, yeah. Ed Hewitt writes, what is Ubuntu's Achilles heel? Oh, harsh. Ooh. <laughs> Ooh, yeah, it's, it's not a whole lot of enthusiasm. Uh, positive. Not feeling the Pulse Audio love. No. Um, and we had an entry from Ken Fallon who said that he was going to appropriately record an audio submission for this competition because it was about Pulse Audio. Excellent. And uh, let's play it now. Oh, <laughs> very yes. good, Ken. Thank very you very good. much but, indeed. But we couldn't hear it. You little tinker. Um, so now we've got to pick a winner from the uh, entries that we've had. I think it's unanimous, really, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah. Jan. Well done, mate. No. Yeah. Oh. <laughs> Apart from Dave, who just dissents. Well, I was gonna, just going to disagree on principle. Oh, right. Okay, fair enough. You so, chose that one. <laughs> oh, yeah, I did. Yeah, I was just going to disagree to be difficult. <laughs> So, so congratulations, Jan, with your What Does a Doctor Listen To When He's Using a Stethoscope? And we will email you the canonical shop code. voucher code, which yes. you can just use on the online store. Well, well done. While we're talking about Pulse Audio, I just thought I'd mention in the updates for Karmic today, oh, yes. there was a nice configuration change that happened to Pulse Audio. It was a Pulse huge Pulse patch, wasn't Pulse it? Audio, and it had, there's a config file for Pulse Audio, and the line changed from disable-shm equals no, to enable dash SHM equals yes. So turning Excellent. it on its head, how appropriate. Ah, ah rather like our little competition. Yay! It's time to delve into the, um, well, it was Ecosphere. Mm -hmm. There has it's, been several other things. It's been along Gerald, the way. Harold, Phyllis, Dustafir, and Margaret. This what should time, we go for this week? This time it's Nigella. Nigella, ooh, I like or that. Or should it be dip into the Nutella? No. No. Okay. Okay. It's Nigella. Mind. What's okay. in Nigella this week? Per Plume has uh, written an interesting blog post about, uh, well, he calls it the aristocratic desktop part mm. three. There's no tray icon in GNOME. So he goes on to say, repeat after me one more time, there is no such thing as a tray icon in GNOME. GNOME has a notification area, ah, yes. which has nothing to do with the Windows-ish obscenity called SysTray. <laughs> this little space where the application can put a little icon. I mean, seriously, have you ever thought about how completely stupid the idea of a tray icon? And he goes on. Yes. He talks about what, why would it be called a tray? What does a tray do for anything? <laughs> yes. And, and the fact that a lot of applications are quite naughty and put icons in the notification area when the, perhaps they don't really need mm. to have not uh, icons like Banshee and um, an open office and things like that sort of put things in that area. The only things that he argues should be there are network status information. Clock. Um, the, yeah, the clock um, and one other. other thing, updates. Yeah, the, the, the notification, I think, mm -hmm. for updates. I think that's right. Um, and the fact that the whole SysTray thing is only called SysTray because the process in Windows... It's called SysTray. It's never been called, allegedly, it's never been called Sys, uh, SysTray by Microsoft. Oh, really? Yeah. The people who did it, the process was called SysTray, one of the processes that was related to it. And that's what you used to see crash. So everybody started to call it the system tray, oh. thinking it was short for Sys, SysTray. Mm. I just say next to the clock. Yeah. Mm. In the but corner. It's, but it's a usability thing because, you know, I mean, the word system tray doesn't mean anything to anybody unless they happen to have grown up with this Microsoft misunderstanding. So calling it a notification area makes sense. Yeah. Liam Green Hughes blogged, if someone designed a Ubuntu set-top box remix, what would it look like? Would it make sense to integrate functionality such as the ability to connect to a wireless network and update packages directly into software such as Boxy through plugins? Or would it be better to design something like Ubuntu Network Remix interface for TV with everything usable with a few button presses on a remote control? Well, this... Obviously, for you using Myth TV, you use Myth TV on, on Ubuntu, a, don't you? I have been known to. Yes. He's Mr. Myth Buntu. And I use Boxy on uh, on Ubuntu. Mm -hmm. And yes, I think what, what Liam's getting at is there, it would be good if there was a set-top box where you could do everything from the remote. Yeah. Because at the moment, I, I have to drop out of Boxy to do updates, which means I have to have a keyboard and mouse plugged in, or I SSH into yeah. the box. Well, it, it's, it's really a discussion between a computer... Um, and a, a computer appliance. server and an appliance. Yeah. Um, now, when we were first forming Mythbuntu, we did actually have a discussion about whether we should have automatic updates, and it was seemed like a bad idea. Mm. It, it is, and I often don't update my Mythbox at home 
because it, firstly it's not externally accessible so it, it's not subject to those sort of vulnerabilities from outside but because it breaks and myth tv is a pain to configure and then so therefore you don't want to install updates that may break it and mean you have to go through a reconfiguration thing when it's the thing that records your tv which is I'm the not, most important thing in the world i'm not so much bothered about automatic updates more that there should be and i think liam talks more about that there should be some interface so in mm. myth tv you could go to a settings button and say yeah. do an update because yeah. for example my my pvr my um set top box which is um a shop bought you know, mm. set-top box has a button and you you press the button and it goes looking for over the air updates or yeah. you plug a serial cable in the back and you squirt a firmware update down the cable which is but like you do it at the, the time geek. of your choosing yes and to be but there's to, a button to do it yeah to be able to do it from the remote is is the ideal really. yeah i don't have to plug a keyboard into it, to it sounds it, like an ssh in sounds like an interesting project hopefully they'll make it happen mm. dgl is an open source gpl licensed game manager Written in Python 2.5 for the GNU Linux operating system. It's inspired by Valve's Steam software for Windows. Can I make a guess? Can I guess that it was Alan that added this? Well, because it's Python. Because you had the Pi game library last episode that was in the news. Actually, no. I just think that there needs to be a way to easily install games. And a lot of people use, or a lot of games use that Steam system on Windows mm. and, and to be able to... Um, easily install and update games and if we had a way to easily deploy games out to linux users then that might be a good way to help promote games on linux there's an interesting um bug report um that was filed after uh jono created this ubuntu community project within launchpad for people to file community-based bugs uh, the bug number is 392799 and part of it reads Hash Ubuntu, which is the IRC channel, it says, is too noisy. 2,000 people is 10 times too many people to have in one IRC channel and expect people to be able to get the help they need. Assuming an average lurker ratio, uh, symptoms of this problem include people constantly asking in the wrong IRC channels after being lost in the noise in Hash Ubuntu. Yeah, I've had that experience with other sort of very popular free software project channel so you just ask your question and you just it just get, scrolls off the top yeah, of the screen exactly. everybody else is asking their question as well and there's yeah. there's not enough people there answering the questions someone did suggest removing people that don't say anything that's not a bad idea well i, mean, I, I lurk no, in there no, and no, sometimes you, and i i look out for well another suggestion was to look for keywords highlights highlights so i have my irc channel highlighting certain words that's what i do and when someone asks a question in that channel, my IRC client pops up and says, oh, someone mentioned screencasts in that. And I'll jump in there and go, here's the best program for you and here's the how-to. Yeah, but then you're talking in the channel. Aren't you? you can't remove people that are lurking. Otherwise, you'd never have anybody in there. you just have loads and loads of people asking questions and nobody to answer them. That's a good point. <laughs> that seems to be the situation now, though. Well, well no, but people might be busy answering other people's questions. So I, I could be sat there and there's no way I can, well, I, before now I've answered three people's questions in a row and been dealing with three people at a, at a time. Yeah, okay. You know, because they go away and try something and then the next person asks a question. But then you the, you get to a limit that your brain can multitask a certain number sure. of people at once. But how many do you have, how many people do you help in the course of a week? Oh, I don't know. I, I dip in and out. Well, so I don't know. the way I've done this is to go into the specific apps IRC channel. If I've got a problem with an application, go onto Launchpad, find out where that app hangs out on IRC, and go to the channel. See that Rather also than... that also has a problem because we've had complaints from um, upstream software projects yep. saying, "Don't send your users here. You should be dealing with them in your own well, channel." No, no. If it's an application problem, yeah. But the, but the, 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 the trouble is, is sometimes you also get the disparity between what the actual upstream create and the modifications we insert in there. Like, for example, okay, the, the, yeah, like for the, the kernel we actually use is nothing like the vanilla kernel you get from kernel.org. Sure. Z, Z A Reason or Zar Reason have released the Terra A20 netbook with Ubuntu, Kubuntu, or even Edge Ubuntu. And System76 have announced the Gazelle Ultra netbook with Ubuntu. So a couple of uh, new netbook releases there. Yeah, I don't think either are available in the UK, but you oh. know, still. Oh, it's good to see Ubuntu. The fun shipped. thing about yeah. the uh, the Gazelle Ultra is that you get a nice uh, Ubuntu badge on the um, on the case. I noticed that, oh, and really? that's why I thought oh, it was worth mentioning. Yeah, yeah, on the front. Yeah, yeah. We're, we're like an Apple logo would be. <laughs> oh, what, on the lid? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Oh, wow. I mean, from the picture, it looks quite Unless nice. Unless that was photoshopped in. I mean, yeah. gimped in. And, and, yeah. to, and to be honest, with Gazelle, they've gone with the whole kind of Ubuntu naming scheme. Yeah, yeah it's a sort of very Ubuntu. You could see that being... a 
release in the future. I you? wonder if we can Gazelle? get to send us one for a review. I think your alphabet is a bit screwy if you think Gazelle is going to be in the future. Well, given we're currently th- on K, there's only 26 letters in the alphabet, and I I can see about two ah. going well into the future. Is he using the, is he using Beyond the Roman Z. alphabet or is he using another one? Special Tony alphabet. <laughs> Karmic Alpha 4 is out. It was announced on the Ubuntu Devel main list and it's been on various blogs and planets. Mm. Excellent. What's yes. in it? Um, Karmic. New. Uh, Ubuntu 1 ships by default. Oh, that was another thing that we found Ooh, out today. Yes. Yeah, that's really cool. In fact, that's the next thing on the list, but we'll mention it now because we're talking about Karmic. Um, Elliot Murphy uh, posted a message on um, Identica. Uh, just a brief message saying, I wonder how many people know that Ubuntu One is going to ship, and we're going to give a free two gig storage. To Actually, everyone. he said he did say storage free, which which sounds quite promising. Yeah, yeah. And to be fair, he did correct that. Okay, and um, that means that anyone who installs Karmic and uh, connects their Ubuntu One or signs up for Ubuntu One gets two gig of free storage. Do we know how they're going to use it? Uh, and what I mean by that is, is it is there a um, an Ubuntu One folder? Or does it take, as was suggested before, the whole of your home directory? And no, it's an Ubuntu no. One folder. Whew. Yeah, th- th- there's no way they could attack your whole home like that, I don't think. Not no. with just two gig, anyway. <laughs> that, would be, that would be a good trap, wouldn't yeah. it? Make your home folder on Ubuntu One and then send you the bill after it's synced online. <laughs> <laughs> but there's also going to be a beta version that has the next set of features that are going to go in Ubuntu One. Exciting times. Mm. Mm. The patent policy has been published. <laughs> That's a lot of peas. It's up on wiki.ubuntu.com slash patent policy. Um, John O'Bacon had a good hand in writing it, but it's come from the discussions of the various boards um, to try and establish uh, Ubuntu's position on patents, software mm. patents. Because, I mean, this is an issue that's been raised a few times now, and uh, this is actually, the patent policy has actually been approved now, hasn't it? So, Yep, technical boards had a go at it. Um, I think they're the main the main people who've driven it. Um, yeah, well, the, they, they took advice from... Um, well, obviously, the, the man at the top is is Mark Shuttleworth, and his advice to the to the technical board was, if uh, we have someone claiming there's a patent violation, mm. then obviously we need to do something about it. But until there is a claim of a patent violation, so woolly rumours about things might infringe yeah. someone's patent aren't, like, aren't good enough. Like the M word. Yes, like the M word we don't speak of. Yes. Um, so... There are procedures in the policy for, as you say, for rights holders trying to report an alleged patent violation. And there's also um, a procedure for developers inquiring about possible patent violations. Oh, interesting. Um, Something that's also quite interesting, if you take out uh, Ubuntu um, uh, support from Canonical, uh, they actually insure you against any patent infringement um, things that would be taken out against you. Do they? That's interesting. Yeah, I saw it. Like Red Hat do. Yeah, yeah. And that's the end of the... Nigella. Nigella. We've got a load of your feedback from the last couple of episodes, and Dave's going to kick it off. We had an email from Ian Wilde. He said, I wonder if you'd consider uh, doing an overview on App Center once Karmic's release date gets closer, uh, so we can have an audio peek uh, before it gets released into the wild. I have no idea what App Center is. No, neither have I. I'm thinking it might be a new software installation thing that's better than ad remove programs. I think essentially it's the center of apt. Okay, well, so basically what we're saying, Ian, is, is we're happy to do a feature on it once we've worked out what it is. Or maybe yeah. if there's an apt center expert out there who'd like to come on and talk to us about it on the show, then yep. get in touch. That would be good. Andy Britton gave us a voicemail, and it says... Hi there, um, my name's Andy Britton. Um, I suppose you'd call me an IT professional. And just wanted to say that I very much like the podcast, enjoy the format, it's uh, very jovial, and I like the banter, it's great fun to listen to. Um, in terms of a question, the thing that uh, stopped me going from sort of Microsoft to um, open source and Ubuntu is basically that stick me in front of a Windows machine and I know how to fix it. Stick me in front of a Ubuntu machine, I've got no clue. And that's the leap that I've got to make somehow. So if there's anything that you can suggest to help me on that journey, that would be fantastic. Thanks a lot for the podcast. Cheers, bye. Hmm. There you go. Problem solving. Cheers, Andy. Good email. There's, uh, good there's, voicemail. Thank you. There's um, some work going on to do a thing called signposts, and part of that is um, helping people to find the right documentation for the thing they need. Because one of the problems we have is like the wiki is just like a big mass of information, and there's man pages everywhere. But what they're trying to do is create a, an easier to find troubleshoot. You know, 
type thing on the mm. wiki. So that might help. I was probably the last person in this room to do this, actually. And I remember the day I did it. Because I dual booted between um, XP and Debian at the time. And uh, in fact, it was you, Al, who said to me, do you know what? Get rid of XP. It's the only way you're going to learn. Yeah. And it is. And yeah. it's absolutely right. Because when you get to something difficult, what you do is, oh, damn, you reboot. Go into XP. Do whatever it is you want to do. And yeah. And you, but you never learn. The only thing yeah. you can do is just say, do you know what? I've got to cut it. Get rid of Windows. Get XP on. Sorry. Get rid of XP. Get Ubuntu on there. And um, find a mentor, somebody somewhere that will, for a period of time, say, yeah, what you need to do is this. What you need to do is yeah. that. And when he says, um, just Google it, then you know you've reached the point of him showing you everything. And that's what you've got to do. Of, of course, there is a problem there because if, uh, I mean, many people don't use a computer as a hobby. They use it as, a, as an instrument. Mm. So if you actually try and switch like cold turkey, as you described there, um, there there's going to be a time there of, of, of lower uh, productivity, isn't there? Mm. So, so how do you actually combat that? Well, that's, I think that's why you need a mentor or someone, someone you know, a go-to guy that you can contact who can, you know, help See, you get uh, over of, those Of times. course, online, we've got the sort of the... the um, the, the loco channels and the mailing lists and things mm. like that. And of course, there's lugs at local Linux user groups as well, isn't And there? books, more and more there are uh, Ubuntu books. Funny you uh, say we, that. We'll get onto that. But we, we get a fair amount of people joining the um, Ubuntu UK channel asking for support, like completely random, you know, out of nowhere. Mm. And they just turn up and say, you know, I'm having a problem with my video card, sound card, or whatever it might be. And volunteers just sit there and help. And now we're not the official support channel. The official support channel is Hash Ubuntu on, on IRC. But that can be seen to be very, very busy. But um, mm -hmm. yeah, join join our channel. Ask a question if you. In fact, you know, actually, inclined. maybe we can even do a segment on getting support in, in the upcoming episode. Yeah, yeah, that'd be good. But I agree 100 percent with Simon. I I did the same thing. Yeah, you know, dual booted for ages because I had everything set up in Windows the way yeah. I liked it, and it was only when my hard drive died and I lost the Windows the Windows installation. And I thought, well, it's now or never. Really, just go with it. Put Ubuntu on it, and and you it was Debian at the time, and you do you force yourself to learn new things. Yeah. Everybody who's a Windows expert now has been not a Windows expert at some point in the past, and they've yeah. learned it all. Yeah. Now, I can understand for work, you might not want to make a harsh change. That you know there'd be training needs and things because you obviously got to make sure you're productive without a big break. But for your home use, you know. Go for it. Just, well, just well, bite the bullet and, and get on. Use the support channels. Use the loco. Use the IRC. Yeah, and, yeah you're, not uh, you're not on your own. You're not. You're not. You're not on your own. And, and chances are, anything you want to do with your computer, somebody else has done it already. I, I'm, I'm going to turn that on its head slightly and say what my experience was. I was dual booting, and eventually I got to a stage where I thought, well, hang on, I haven't actually booted into Windows for like over a month and a half now. I don't need it anymore. <laughs> when you when you when you're in that situation and you boot into Windows and every single application opens asking to be updated, you know <laughs> it's time oh. to switch. But also yeah. when you actually get annoyed that you that Windows doesn't work as you expect because you're now more familiar with no Yeah, more. that's a great position to be in. Yeah. <laughs> Frustrating but great. Well, yeah. I think we should say good luck to Andy and yeah, let us know how you get on. Yeah, yeah. Or drop by the channel and um, say hi. Sati Pera. I think it is. Sally Pera emailed in and said, I'm listening to your podcast now. I think it's really good. However, I felt compelled to email to ask the person who keeps saying, wow, all the time to please stop. Keep up the good work. Yeah, that would be me. Wow. Is that, who's that? Is that I Alan? think, well, I think you guys identified me as the person who said, well, I, I don't know. I think I might be one of them as well. I think it was during a telephone interview we did with Dust uh, Dustin Kirkland. Yeah, right. It was. And he was saying quite cool stuff. And I kept going, wow. And uh, yeah, <laughs> I'm sorry. Yeah, so perhaps we'll replace it with something equally annoying. What, replace me? <laughs> <laughs> with something awesome. equally annoying. <laughs> I don't think that's possible. Today. Yeah. We could, you could try saying jeepers or something like that instead. Jingies or okay. something. Yeah. Cool, blimey, governor. I'll, I will go away and make it my mission to find out something less annoying to say. Um, so we need to thank Aaron Nash and Andrew Smith who've been helping us debug the problem um, with playing OG files on various Cowan and Samsung OG players. Um, the problem we have worked out is to do with the cover art, the embedded cover art. Which oh, the is, picked our logo. Yeah, so the little UEPC logo. And it seems that some players don't like it and Ooh. crash. There is uh, an upgraded firmware for the Cowan players, which you can get from the website, which doesn't really fix the problem. Instead of crashing the player, it just refuses to play the file. 
Oh, right. So I suppose that's better in some ways. So, hang on. Do they find this on other podcasts or only ours? I think we're the only people who bothered to firstly do an OG version (laughs) and secondly to embed cover art in it. I think the outlaws do. They are they, okay. Maybe do they, maybe they don't embed cover art in their old version. I don't know. Mm. Um, but it does seem to be a genuine problem. So we've got to think: is it worth us just getting rid of the cover art for the old version for the people who listen to it on the uh, on the Cowan and Samsung type devices, or <laughs> have a separate RSS feed for, for people with broken. Aaron Nash <laughs> and a separate RSS feed, RSS feed for uh, Andrew Smith. Smith. But it has been. At least we know what the problem is now. We're just going to decide what to do about it. Okay. Cool. But thank you for your help, guys. Paul from the Land Down Under emailed in. I've just re-listened to the first podcast from season two. At the end of it, you read my letter and made a comment that you will have to have a four-hour and one-minute podcast so it's just longer than my daily commute. Oh, yeah. (laughs) Yeah. I remember that now. (laughs) For the last few months, I have changed from driving all the way uh, to the train station and taking the train. So it's now a three-hour each way or six-hour total. Ouch. That's a a long commute. Actually, that's longer than some people actually work in a day. (laughs) Um, Speaking so he, from personal experience. <laughs> <though>. <laughs> Lots of time to listen to the podcast about Linux, etc. Wow. So we've got to do six hour long shows or six hour and one minute long shows just to More wreck interviews. it all up again. Well, what you could do is uh, slow the playback down. So it takes longer. <laughs> I know some people who speed it up to make it, you know, make their life, get some of their hours of their life back. But um, yes. Hmm. No, we're not going to talk that long. It, it may seem like it <laughs> that we do, but we have not. Aldo Noguera emailed in. When I was listening to the last episode, season two, episode nine, I suddenly noticed that you were talking about someone who had the same problem that I had. Hmm, interesting. And then I realised it was me. <laughs> I rewound the podcast to where, to where you spoke my name, and it was so weird that I couldn't recognise it. Ah, <laughs> so we we'll oh, probably just probably compounded that again. I'm not complaining. It's just very funny. Um, and we didn't have a clue, and I did, and you had not a clue from where I am from. By the way, he lives in Rio de Janeiro, Brazil, and they speak Portuguese. How fantastic is that? Yeah, it's great. Someone in Brazil is listening to us. I know, and That's we can't say his name correctly. Yeah, what I'm you need really to do, Aldo, just... is ring our voicemail number, which may be a bit expensive internationally, but you know, or record a WAV file. Or record a WAV file. Yeah, saying your name, like like the Linus Torvalds clip. <laughs> Oh, and, no, uh, do one that says, us. my name is Aldo, and your proper name, and I listen to the, the Ubuntu, Ubuntu UK, UK podcast. podcast. Excellent. Please Excellent. do that. That would be brilliant. And that's all your feedback for this time. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you for listening, and thanks to everyone who took part via Twitter and Identica. If you'd like to get hold of us, you can email the show via podcast at ubuntu-uk.org. You can leave us a voicemail on a number of ways. You can telephone 0845 508 and 1986 or point your VoIP client at a podcast at sip.ubuntu-uk.org. And finally, if you Skype, you can record a message via Skype (laughs) using uh, Ubuntu UK podcast as our Skype name. You can send us your comments via Identica and Twitter as well using identity.ca slash UUPC or twitter.com slash UUPC as well as getting updates from recording sessions and getting your chance to put questions to our interviewee guests. Alternatively, if you're into IRC, you can chat to us via the hash Ubuntu-UK channel on the Freenode IRC network. Join our Facebook fan page. <laughs> 209. Uh, really? <laughs> that's not bad uh, search for Ubuntu a UK podcast I think we said we wanted to hit 200 before the end of the year so we've done that that's nice. good oh wow well done of course 50 of them are Tony and his various alter egos mm. and secret projects yeah we welcome suggestions material tips reviews or rants and feedback both positive and negative so please do get in touch thanks also to our network of community mirrors who are listed on the website thanks for listening everyone yep Goodbye. Join us next time. Bye. Bye.